can present it. Okay. Uh, Scott's gone. You can also share your screen. That's what I'm doing. Oh, you are? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right, hopefully it is. Yeah, stop sharing. Yeah, you should be sharing my screen. And move your camera to like the side, maybe. There we go. Like, click on slideshow. Does it still show my camera? Uh, it does. I guess uh, I can minimize it. Are you screen sharing? Are you recording too? Yeah. Okay. I hope I did click on record. Yeah, yeah. it looks like it's fine. Great. Please go back. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's my first time giving a lecture, so I'm as good as I can be. Do you want the cheese? No, you're going to be great. Sure. If you don't want to use all these. Uh, I mean, I have to write it. It's hard to hear me. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you should I speak English? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works. Sure. <laughs> I think, like, unless you need to get really close to it, it doesn't. Just pull a Ariane Goyle from Boss GM. Yeah. Physics building. I speak Let's just wait a few more minutes. Yeah. You should put this in your pocket so you like if you move. Then you can just like fall. Yeah. Attendance usually like for these lectures. It's not. Oh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a really popular detail. Yeah. Yeah. We can reduce some of these things. Yeah, it's not anymore, but it was for a few seconds. That scared me. <laughs> I think I need this. Yeah, this was a good idea. I should have done that. That's fine, I guess. Yeah. You probably don't need it as we knew it was such a desire. I'm so terrible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I am a GA, but I have like admin responsibilities. I don't have a section. So we just started a few more minutes. Hopefully, seven ten should be enough to really get settled in. You know, there's a restroom. Let's go. I get my part. Uh, sure. I can wait. <laughs> Are we both going to be here when we are presenting? Or what's, what's, what's going to happen? What? Are we both going to be in this area when we are both presenting? Or what's it's gonna happen. Uh, a down brighter yeah. option. What do you mean? Like, like, so like when I'm presenting, right? are you gonna be here? And when you're presenting, am I gonna be here oh, as yeah, well? Yeah, sure. I mean, I can. Yeah, I'll be here. It's almost seven ten. Maybe like two minutes. Yeah. It's fine. Just start. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we will get started in two minutes. Okay, we're taking. Yeah, like literally
Okay, it's seven ten, so probably a good time to start. So, hey, my name's Aryan. I'm one of the facilitators for this decal, and I'm going to be presenting today's lecture on tree training with Verona today. So, I guess uh, for important announcements, uh, I think homework one is going to be due next Tuesday. So, probably start that if you haven't already. Um, the quiz for this week will probably go live tomorrow. Uh, not quite sure yet, but you'll try to get it up as soon as possible. So I guess like without further ado, let's jump right in. So I guess before we start the official pre-training part of this lecture, um, I'm gonna go somewhat into detail into what representation learning is. And I think this should sort of cap off the last two weeks of deep learning um, and probably give you a, a more comprehensive understanding of what deep learning actually is doing. And yeah, hopefully the last lectures will make more sense after this context. So, I guess before we jump into deep learning, let's talk a bit about shallow learning. So say you have the classical machine learning problem and the way the setup is you have some input X and you extract the features from this input X and you pass it into some model that is gonna be parameterized by some data to get an output Y. So keep in mind that uh, this sort of theta is going to contain all of your learned parameters. So if you have a neural network, this would contain all of your weights, biases, any other things that you might want to learn. If this is, say, a regression model, this would just contain the weights and maybe a bias term if it's if if, if one is there. But yeah, this this theta can, is is going to represent all of your weights. And uh, instead of passing in the input x directly, we would extract some features from it using this function phi, which is what you're gonna call a feature extractor. Now, why don't we push, why don't we input the um, term X in directly? It's, it might not be something that you can. So let's say that you're working on a problem of predicting the price of a house from a house. So your X can be a house. You can't really put that into your model, right? You would have to extract some information about the house, which is then something that you could input into a model. So this information can be, you know, things like the number of rooms in the house, uh, the size of the house, how old it is. That can be categorical variables, like does it have a pool, a backyard, a basement, any of that. So once you extract these relevant features, you can get your output Y, or you can get a prediction Y, and your goal is to learn these weights in such a way such that your predicted label, your predicted output is as close to the true label as possible. So just to sort of recap, uh, the machine learning pipeline, you start with an input X, you extract all the relevant features from it, um, and then you push those into a machine learning algorithm to get an output Y, and you sort of optimize based on that. So I guess now we defined this feature extractor as something that we need to, we, it, this is something that we need to define, right? So. And you, and you might imagine that different kinds of problems will have different kinds of feature extractors. So if your data is arranged in say a table, so if you go back to the housing prices example, you could maybe say that each row is a single house and each column is one of the features. Now getting these features is pretty easy because you can just take each row directly, right? Or you can also maybe take a column depending on however the data is arranged in this tabular format. But what if your input is something complex, like it can be text, audio, images, right? How do you extract all the relevant features from such a complex input? Um, since this is a CV class, I'm gonna go over the CV example. And turns out that there are special feature extractors for images. So this is sort of what um, classical machine, classical CV looked like. You, people would come up with all of these like different kinds of feature extractors. One really common example, is something called hog or histogram oriented gradients. It sort of captures the edge information in, a, in an image. And based on that, you can train some sort of like classifier model on top of that. So say this, is, this can be an SVM with um, learned weights, for example. 
Now, something you have to notice is that this feature extractor is something that you have to program yourself. This is not something that's being learned right now. It's something that you come up with yourself based on your intuition about the problem, whatever you think might be the most relevant features for this problem, right? And if you think about this, this can be a very challenging task. If you, you can't really use the same feature extractor across multiple tasks, right? So if you want, if you have a task that has to do with the colors in an image, this sort of, these features won't really do anything because this gives you edge information, right? You would have to define a different feature extractor. Does that make sense? So this process of choosing the right features can get really complicated really fast. And this is also kind of a compromise solution in the sense that you are learning the weights of your model, but you are still hand programming the feature extractor yourself. Why don't we, we, we want to make this whole process automatic, right? We had, but as of right now, only the second half is automatic, the learning of the weights. We are still defining the features ourselves. And this is sort of where deep learning comes in. So deep learning says that, hey, we don't need to hand program feature extractors. We can, all, we can learn those as well. In fact, we can learn the entire pipeline from feature extraction to um, training. And you, you, could, you just need to pass in this like raw image input and it will spit out an output. And you won't have to hand program anything specific in, uh, in, in either side of the pipeline. So one example of this is you can use a something called the convolutional layer. Again, don't worry about what a con layer is. That is something that we will teach you guys next week. But it is a neural network layer that can extract features from an image. And this extractor has parameters that can be learned. So instead of um, something, like, something like hog, which is sort of a very stationary in the sense that it doesn't really change, you, you still have the same thing. Uh, you can learn this feature extractor and you can then pass these features into a learned algorithm. So in, in, both, steps, in both steps of this process, you're learning something, right? And, and you might think that, okay, we have two different steps and we're learning something, but why keep those steps separate? Why decouple those two? And what, what if you combine them? And that's exactly what a neural network is. A neural network is a model that combines both feature extraction and output prediction, and it learns everything from the data. So hopefully this sort of gives you uh, uh, some context as to why deep learning has been sort of taking off um, and classical machine learning is not as used in areas like vision anymore because deep learning allows you to sort of automate this entire process from end to end. And in a sense, what you're really doing is you're learning a representation of your input, right? So your features are a way to represent what that input looks like. Because a model doesn't know what an image is, a model will know what the features of that image are because that's what it's receiving, right? So in a sense, what deep learning is doing is it's allowing you to learn good abstract representations from the data itself and without having to manually do anything. And the main idea is to sort of like relinquish all control to the model and let it learn whatever it needs to learn for whatever task it is trying to solve. And in a sense, you can view each layer in a neural network as a learned feature extractor, and you are chaining these feature extractors on top of each other, right? So uh, a single layer might receive some kind of input. It learns how to best represent that, represent that input, and it can pass that representation along to another layer that comes after it. So a, a deep neural network is basically learned representations that are stacked on top of each other. And these representations are going to be kind of hierarchical. So if you look at the, this image right over here, we have a neural network that whose goal is to sort of uh, predict something about a car. So then if, if you input in the image of a car, you can see that the earlier layers, what they're trying to do is they're trying to look for, so like these like smudges that you see of like black and white, well, what, what this is doing is, it's trying to look for different kinds of edges in the car. So if you have a straight line, it's trying to look for a 
a straight edge, right? So it's trying to look for different kinds of patterns and like low level and like low level information like edges from the image. But as you go further along, instead of looking at these low level details, you're trying to look at something more concrete. So a later layer might be trying to see if this image has say a wheel, maybe a door, maybe a window, something else that might be in a car. And by the very end, the final layers are trying to see if the input image had a car in the first place. Now, this model has a mental model of what a car looks like. It's not something that we know, but it's some sort of abstract model that only the model knows. And as you can see that as you go deeper down the network, it's trying to become more and more abstract. So I guess the thing I want you, I want you to take away from this is that depth refines representations. You start with coarse information like edges, and you go all the way down to like fine information, like this mental model of a car. So I know that this was a lot of information. Does anyone have any questions about any of the any of this? Uh, in case not, I'm gonna pass the mic on to Verona, who will talk about transfer learning. Okay, yeah. So now that we've sort of gone over an overview of what representation learning is, we'll talk a little bit about what transfer learning is and what the benefits might be. So when we train a model from scratch, which we don't usually do a lot of the times, uh, it takes a lot of time, compute and training data. So to just to give you an idea of how much data is often necessary to train a pretty good model, even just a few thousand examples is often not nearly enough. It takes a lot of data for a model to learn properly. And of course, it's also very expensive to train a model. Um, but luckily, huge models have already been trained before. So the sort of question is, can we leverage them in some way? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So you might have heard of what we've called pre-trained models. And many of these pre-trained models are frequently used all the time. And so we can take a look at how and why we might want to use them. So if we train a model from scratch, our model parameters or our weights are randomly initialized in the beginning. And then we update them gradually through an optimization algorithm such as a stochastic gradient descent or something like Atom. And so let's say, for example, that we have two separate tasks that we want to solve using some sort of deep learning technique. So without transfer learning, we might have to train these two models separately from scratch, which as I mentioned earlier, is very costly in terms of time, compute, and data. So the idea is, can we do better? And so when we learn something, we often find in general, you know, just like us ourselves, what we can use what we've learned already and apply them, our skills and our knowledge to other domains. Right, so just to give a, a little example, you know, once we've taken a sort of intro programming course like 61A, we don't continue to learn programming from scratch each time we have the program where we take another course like 61B or 61C. We already know the high level important ideas and we only need to focus on the new stuff after. So we can same, basically apply the same idea to our neural network. So as an example, Let's say we have a convolutional neural network um, trained for a single or a simple computer vision task, like a cat versus dog classification or some sort of object detection. And again, no worries if a convolution is sort of familiar, we'll cover convolutions and CNNs in much greater depth very soon. Um, but we'll notice that even though these tasks are slightly different from each other, our models should be able to learn some sort of suitable representation of the respective inputs. So for example, um, each of these models should be able to, for example, capture how low level features, as Aryan mentioned, such as the general shape, the edges, the patterns and the colors um, are for this data um, in the lower layer. So the more earlier layers of our neural network. 
And then once we've moved on and we've gotten towards the later layers, um, they should be able to capture some higher level features such as the abstractions of the cats versus the dogs, um, people's faces, or some of the major objects in the later, later layers. So here is a small example of some of the layers for um, some sort of object detection or classification task. Um, so in the first layer, we can see that we have features like colors and patterns that are similar, uh, tightly close to each other. And then we have shapes and maybe some textures. And then once we've gone to something like layer three, um, usually, just to give you an idea, there are we don't usually train like a five layer neural network, but like a lot of the times there'll be like 100 layers, for example, depending on how um, deep we want it to be. Um, so, but in this example, well, we start sort of abstracting in layer three, um, where we see objects and humans. Um, and then once we reach layer five, at the end, we reach to a close to final level of abstraction that we want. And just for a slightly more concrete example, let's say we train a residual neural network on the ImageNet data set. Um, so again, don't worry about what a residual neural network is, but basically we can train a deep residual neural network with many, many layers for tasks like classification or object detection. And good thing this has already basically been done for us. So how can we use this ResNet ImageNet classifier and transfer the knowledge that we've learned from this to other tasks? So we want to figure out what aspects of this network is already shared among the other ones. And we want to keep that shared information and then basically use that kept information for our other models. So how I, we actually go about this. Um, and so in other words, like how do we actually transfer or do transfer learning? Um, does anyone have any ideas perhaps of how we might want to keep certain information from a previous pre-trained model and transfer that knowledge? Yeah, that's basically the right idea. What about you? We just copy the weights, maybe? Yeah. So very similar. Um, one of the more common ideas is that, well, basically, our neural networks are just stacks of layers. So the idea is, can we keep certain layers and basically use that on our next model? So there's an idea called freezing. Um, so that's basically what you guys both mentioned. One idea is to freeze certain layers of our neural network. So basically, we use our pre-trained network, which is like the already trained ResNet classifier, um, discard a few of the layer layers, and then freeze the remaining earlier layers. And so we can add and train the later layers to basically customize them in a way um, that sort of satisfies the task that we want to perform on uh, for the second task. And also remember how the later layers are often the higher level abstractions, and the earlier layers are the general shapes, edges, patterns. Um, so we generally want to keep those general shapes, textures, patterns, um, but our abstractions might be a bit different depending on the type of task that we, you know, we want to solve on our second task. So we can add and train our new custom layer, later layers. And the layer weights of a trained model are not changed when they're reused in a downstream task. And by freezing layers, you might imagine we're not really modifying the weights or our parameters. And so that backward pass that we talked about earlier in the past few lectures can be basically avoided. So the speed of our model increases by a lot by doing this. Um, just sort of a note is when you're trying to freeze certain layers, be careful of where you're freezing your, your, your models. So if you freeze layers too early on, um, that's basically sort of useless. Like this can lead to pretty inaccurate predictions because you're not really understanding the low level um, edges, for example. Um, and just to sort of go back to the CNN example. So a CNN model with several, several layers that's trained on a pretty large image data set like ImageNet, um, it can be reused by removing the last few layers 
um, depending on the, the task that you're, you're trying to do, the second task, you can either remove just like one or a few layers and then have the model classify some new image categories, for example. So instead of cats or dogs, maybe let's say you want to, I don't know, um, understand like how to classify another animal. Um, so you might want to just change the last few layers um, or you can also use like a larger data set. Okay. So another common technique is called fine tuning. So instead of freezing our layers, we can fine tune our pre-trained neural network. So instead of discarding the later layers, we can basically train our um, pre-trained model a bit more on some output layers and non-frozen layers from our original neural network. So the more data that we generally have for our downstream task, the more that we can unfreeze the layers of our original data, our original model, and then fine tune them again for our specific second task. Um, and sometimes we might want to fine tune the whole pre-trained network rather than just the unfrozen layers. Um, so essentially we sort of initialize our new neural network to the pre-trained network um, the weights instead of initializing them at random. So remember when we sort of pre or train our network from scratch, we're initializing our weights initially in the very uh, um, randomly in the beginning. So now we can take the pre-trained the weights from the pre-trained network and use those instead of initializing them at random. And so again, this speeds up our training process as the parameters of the neural network is taken from the pre-trained parameters. Okay, so. Um, one other question that you might have is how do we sort of decide between whether we want to freeze or fine tune? Um, so there are a few main factors that you might want to consider, but the two main important ones are the size of your new data set um, and the similarity of the new data set to the original data set. So for example, in the case one, um, where you have um, a small, small data set or a large, a large data set, and it's pretty similar to the original data set. Since it's larger, we have more confidence that we won't overfit if we fine tune. So we've briefly talked about overfitting in the past, and this is a topic that will continue to come up uh, when we train um, uh, a network. And so um, on the other hand, if we have a smaller data set, even though it's similar to the original model, it's not a good idea sometimes to fine tune because you can definitely overfit. Um, and then in the third case in which you have like a small, small data set, and then it's pretty different from the first task, um, you can probably, um, fix some of the initial layers, but you don't want to really fine tune. And then at the very end, you have a very large second data set, but it's very different from the first task. Um, so you can probably just train it from scratch, but in practice, um, it's mostly beneficial to initialize your weights from the pre-trained, pre-trained model. Okay, so um, before we sort of get into embeddings, um, just some practical advice. So just a few other things to keep in mind when you're performing transfer learning. Um, so think about the constraints of your pre-trained models. Um, think about what sort of task it was sort of trying to accomplish in the beginning, um, the data that it was trained on, and then also consider your learning rates. So we'll talk a little bit more about learning rates in, in um, greater depth again next week when we talk about some of these um, more particular models. Okay, um, in terms of neural networks, embeddings are pretty important. So they are often described as lower dimensional um, learned continuous vector representations of discrete variables. So neural network embeddings are useful because they can reduce the dimensionality of your categorical variables, for example, and meaningfully represent them um, in the transform space. So in this photo example, they have decided to use Tisney uh, for the dimensionality reduction. Um, so taking the embedding vector dimensions and mapping them to a 2D space in this case, um, plotted. they also plotted the embeddings and then they color coded this off of the genre of the book. So they took like book data and then basically did some dimensionality reduction and mapped them. Um, so just as a summary, like embeddings are pretty useful for like represent representing um, high dimensional data. Okay, and very very closely linked to embeddings is something called a latent space. So 
we often prefer to work with lower dimensional data. So a common task is transforming them in, from high dimensional data into lower dimensional structures. So we can capture this through something called a latent space of features, which basically encode all of the important information that represents a high dimensional, the high dimensional data. And so to be clear on the terminology, uh, we often say that high dimensional data is embedded in a lower dimensional space, latent space. And a lot of the time, uh, latent space is sort of interchangeable with like an embedding space. Um, and so something to note here is that what we often, is what we often call the curse of dimensionality. Um, one of the reasons that high dimensional data or high dimensional spaces can be bad is because if the data is naturally a lower dimensional structure, it's going to be very sparsely spread out in your latent space, as you can imagine, um, in high dimensional spaces. So um, a lot of the times you want to be careful about, yeah, I don't know, you can sort of draw something. Yeah. But like, you can imagine like if something is naturally a lower dimensional structure in high dimensional spaces, it's going to be like very, very sparse. So this is an example that I came up with. So say that you have this 3D space, but your data is along this line. Now, your data is basically has a one dimensional structure, right? You don't need to work with the entire 3D space because you don't need to. And this sort of goes back to the idea of cursive dimensionality because you can see that all of these points occupy a very small region of space in 3D, right? So the idea is that if we can directly work with this line, if we can somehow find a way to represent this line using just one variable instead of three, and so if you use, say, the XYZ coordinates, that's going to be better because like a uh, high dimensional data can be very complex. We want to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah. Thanks. OK. And so obviously, one of the big questions is, how do we actually get our embedding? So well, we can basically learn them. And so one way is to learn an embedding as part of our neural network for our target task. So this sort of allows us to get an embedding that's nicely customized for our particular task, but it may take longer than training the embedding separately. Um, and the idea here is that we can basically reuse our embeddings for other tasks. Um, again, embeddings, they're sort of just like what we talked about earlier. The broad idea is that we're trying to um, represent our data in meaningful ways. Um, so here's sort of an example. Um, honestly, it's sort of like, I don't know, we talk about, we don't really quite talk a lot about soft, uh, soft max, but um, you can sort of see how there's different ways. Like we have um, one hot target probably. Um, so it's like pretty sparse as we talked about earlier. So, um, I didn't do this. Do you remember how this part? What's up? The target class. Maybe? Oh, yeah. Um, oh. So this example, uh, it's an example about uh, training something called an MNIST classifier. So oh. MNIST is a data set of hand-drawn uh, digits. It's a 28 by 28 image, which you can actually represent using a single vector as a 784-dimensional vector, but a 28 by 28 is 784. So what you can do is you can train a model that would classify um, what digit the image contains um, using this. And, and it's going to be one of uh, 10 digits uh, from 0 to 9. This is what those target class labels sort of um, identify over there. And you train this using a softmax loss because softmax is the loss that is used for classification. I don't know if we talked about this before. I guess not. But it, it, it's basically because it's, it's a loss function. Don't worry too much about it. So. The idea is that once you train this model, you can take, um, can you see my cursor? You can, once this model has been trained, these three like sort of neurons in the middle of the model can then be used as an embedding for this MNIST image. So once this model has been trained, this uh, weights must have learned something meaningful, right? So this means that we could just take some of these uh, layers in the middle, take the output of that as a representation of this 20 dimensional, 28 by 28 dimensional image. Yeah. Okay. And so here's sort of an example of some of the results from training networks from scratch versus applying some sort of transfer learning um, from a paper. 
So in this example, the authors compared pre-trained convolutional neural networks for audio classification using transfer learning. Uh, and they found that the retrained models with transfer learning applied actually achieved better accuracy, classification accuracy than retraining the network from scratch. So not only is it less computationally expensive, but it also helps achieve better results. So here's sort of another summary of some of the major advantages of pre-trained networks. So a lot of the time, um, pre-trained networks are trained on very, very large data sets. And oftentimes, again, more data means better representations. So if we're only given a little data, um, using some sort of pre-trained network can be a great idea. Um, there are also a lot of pre-trained networks that we can use immediately. So you can use models that have been trained on large data sets already, just search them up on like hugging face or something or import them directly and use them. And we can also pre-compute and store our embeddings instead of using the original high dimensional data, which can again, save a lot of time and storage. Okay, and so here's just a very, very broad summary. So without transfer learning, we're basically trying to learn two separate tasks and train our models separately. Um, but then with transfer learning, we basically apply the knowledge that we've learned from one pre-trained network and apply that to the second task. And so we've talked about two main techniques for doing that, freezing some layers and fine tuning our, our pre-trained network. Um, yeah, so very broad, once again, you basically just apply your knowledge to, um, and try to transfer that to another task instead of relearning everything. Um, and just a quick note, we'll go into some details and examples of this in action, but especially, um, I know this is not an NLP course, we, we talk more about CV, but transfer learning is especially huge in NLP. As you can imagine with natural language, once you've trained on a large, large amount of text, there's no reason for you to relearn all of that. Um, so you already know the meaning. So there's like some semantic meaning of words. Once you've pre-trained, you can understand syntax. So you can imagine in tasks for natural language processing, um, it takes a lot of time if you want to retrain an entire network. So using pre-trained um, networks and using transfer learning is a really, really good idea. But not only does that apply to NLP, it applies to almost other domain, every other domain, um, like CV. Yeah. Yeah. So we will transition to the next part of the lecture, which is going to be on self-supervised pre-training. So before I tell you what self-supervised is. Let's clarify some terminology. So if you think back to how we described the machine learning setup to you, the way it usually works is you define some model, you take some input X, which is gonna be your raw data, and it gives you some um, output, say Y hat. And you define this notion of a loss that sort of compares how far apart this prediction is from the ground truth label Y, right? And your goal is to optimize the network such that this error decreases and your model is trying to output something that is very close to the actual labels Y. So in a sense, your training process is receiving supervision from the labels. Your, super, your labels are guiding what the model must learn. And some examples of, and, and this whole process is called um, supervised learning, like the name suggests. And some examples of supervised learning can be your typical classification problem, like the one that we just showed where you classify digits, you're checking in some image of a, of a handwritten digit and you have a label corresponding to that. It can also be something like regression. If you have taken say 16A or 16B, I think you might've seen regression in those classes. Um, there are other examples of object detection, segmentation. We will discuss those in the coming weeks. So now we know that we can learn if we have both the labels and the raw data, do you think we can learn if we just have the raw data? And it turns out we can. So even without any labels, we can still learn something meaningful about the structure of the raw data. How many, um, have you guys taken 16B before? So yeah, you, you might have, you might recall something called PCA from the class, uh, principal component analysis. 
it's actually one of the most common unsupervised learning algorithms out there. Because if you remember correctly, we just input some data matrix into that algorithm and it spits out those principal time one inductors, right? You don't, you never feed in any labels into that algorithm. You just feed in the data matrix. Um, if you remember from the 16B car, one thing that you did was to, you, you took the audio signals from the words that you would pass to the car and you would cluster them together. Again, there were, there were no labeling involved. You just took each audio signal, um, projected it down to two dimensions and clustered them with other points. So yeah, it turns out that uh, dimensionality eruption with PCA, clustering, et cetera, et cetera, are common examples of um, unsupervised learning. And this is sort of, and this is sort of, uh, hopefully it will give you a clearer picture of what's going on. So in the first picture, you have different points and they have labels associated with them. So in a classification task, you're going to predict what the labels are and you can draw like decision boundaries based on that. But even if you don't have any labels, the model can still learn that, okay, these points are grouping up together. They're forming clusters. And this is still like meaningful information that the model can learn. So yeah, hopefully it sort of, it, this picture makes clear the difference between unsupervised and supervised learning. So the examples that we have discussed so far when we were going over transfer learning was supervised pre-training. So we take these large models that were trained on say something like ImageNet. And usually these models like a ResNet are trained for the ImageNet classification task. Uh, the ImageNet classification task is where you train a, a CNN on the ImageNet data set, which has a million different images and a thousand different classes. And it needs, and the classifier has to learn to like classify those images correctly. And since this is classification is a supervised learning problem, you have a label associated with each of the each of the uh, images in the data set. Now we mentioned before that large data sets are helpful for learning more generalizable representations. So what if we take this idea further? ImageNet only has a million examples, but you can find like a billion images on the web, or even trillions. Right. So, what if you try to like harness all of them to learn representations, and this goes beyond CV as well. So, a common data set that people use in NLP is the um, English Wikipedia. So, and this usually has like hundreds of millions of um, text tokens in that, but you can find like a trillion tokens on the internet of text. Right. So, what if you try to harness all of this information, and maybe you can learn better representations using that. And turns out, and this is a pretty good idea also, uh, but it turns out that these large data sets are usually not labeled. You can, you could like scrap text or image or images from the web, but you can't really label them automatically, right? So a lot of the time you're working with unlabeled data. So we wanna see if we could use unsupervised learning techniques to this unlabeled data sets and learn representations using that. And this is also appealing because labeling in general is a very time consuming and tedious process. Say that you want to label a billion images, you would have to hire manual labor, you would have to pay the, you would have to pay the labor, you would have to pay for storage, it would be very time consuming. It would also be very expensive. And it just turns out that gathering good labels is simply a very, very hard process. And so the, the question that researchers ask is if it could do unsupervised representation learning and indeed we can. So before I delve into that, I want to clarify one more term. So the way unsupervised representation learning is done is simply to do something called self-supervised learning. Now, like the name suggests, self-supervised learning means that the data is receiving supervision from itself. You, you, you still don't have any labels with the, in, the, in the data set. You still only have, say, a collection of images. But what you can do is you can create labels from those images and train in a supervised manner. Now, how this is typically done is, uh, I'll just read off the statement from the Facebook AI research blog, is the general technique of self-supervised learning is to predict any unobserved or hidden part or property of the input from any observed or unhidden part of the input. So let's say you have an image, you hide some information about the image from the model, and the model has to predict the hidden part from the unhidden part. And this information can be hidden across time or space. We will go over some examples soon. And actually we will have an entire lecture dedicated to self-supervised learning for 
um, in, in Vision uh, in a few weeks. So we'll uh, delve deeper uh, in that lecture too. So again, some more terminology before I, before I go on to examples. So during our discussion of transfer learning, we have been referring to two different tasks as task one and task two, which is you know not a very descriptive name. It turns out that in the context of self-supervised learning, these two tasks actually have a special name. So the task on which you train the representations, you know what, what we have been referring as to task one for so long is also called a pretext task. And the task to which the representations are transferred down to are also called a downstream task. Now, different domains may have different kinds of downstream tasks. So in computer vision, this can be something like you learn the representations from some pretext task and you use those representations for image classification or object detection or semantic segmentation or, or whatever. For NLP, this could be something like text classification, machine translation, um, document summarization, question answering, any of that. Uh, it turns out that this is also possible for RL. You could pre-train something called a policy in RL and then fine tune that later for different kinds of tasks. Again, don't worry if you, know, if you don't know what that means. But yeah, just wanted to show that pre-training is a very broad topic and self-supervised learning algorithms can be applied to different domains. So I guess we can delve into examples now. So this was a paper that was published in 2017 and it was called Jigsaw. What the authors do is they take an image, they take some part of the image and divide it into a three by three grid. So you get nine patches. And what they do is they shuffle the patches around and ask the model to predict the original order. So the hope is that if the model can learn to predict the original order, like what patch goes in the, let's say the top left corner versus the top right corner, it is trying to learn something meaningful about the image. So it's not just focusing on say, low level features anymore, but it's also trying to understand what's going on in the image. It's, it's going to learn that an image can be made up of different parts and those parts are gonna be related to each other. Um, there are some more technical details on the slides. Um, I won't go into those, but something that the authors actually did, I actually will mention this, is when they sample the patches and they divide it into a grid, instead of taking the grid directly, they actually jitter each patch a bit. So the patches are like not next to each other because if they are, the model can just learn to see if the pixels along the edge match each other and it really won't learn anything in that case because it, it will just be, you know, because like matching pixels is a very easy task to, is a very easy way to like cheat this process, right? So, which is why you might see a non-perfect grid in uh, image A. Any questions about this task before I move on? Yeah. Yeah, so what they did is they actually take, they, they took the representations from this pretext task and tested it on um, classification and detection um, downstream tasks. Um, I think I have some numbers up there. Uh, it turned out that this was sort of the best um, pretext task at the time. And it actually, and the, it actually sort of bridged the gap between supervised and self-supervised learning in a sense um, on, on these different uh, classification and, and detection tasks. So yeah. Another task is the rotation. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I guess for this task, right? Like, so they can do the network on the Jigsaw task. Um, are they doing it in like a templated process that like keeps the like they encoder from the network and train it on like classification or whatever? Or are they like spitting in it and getting the classification and passing it to like some linear classifier? Like, like, that? like, is it, is it like, a, like an actual training tool or are they like, Uh, if I remember correctly, I think they took like most of the backbone from the original model, and I think they just took the I think they treated that as like a frozen feature extractor and took the representations that way. Um, another task is something called Rotnet. Uh, it's sort of a similar idea, but instead of predicting, let's say, a shuffle order, 
what you do instead is you take an image, you, you rotate it by some number of degrees, and which is selected from zero, 90 degrees, 180, or 270 degrees, and you ask the model to predict the rotation angle from this rotated, from this rotated image. And the hope is that, and, and if, you, if you look at the sort of example over here, even if you rotate this image of a bird, the fact that its beak and its eyes are close together doesn't really change. They're, they're still gonna be close together in each image. And the fact that its sort of claws are pushing on this branch is still gonna be the same in each image. So the hope is that the model can learn some of that information is that a single image might have different kinds of objects and it might have to learn to focus on say something like the object's orientation, location, pose, type, et cetera, et cetera instead of just focusing on, again, low level details. And I think this sort of next example makes it more clear. So on the left-hand side, you have a model that was trained in a fully supervised manner. And when you look at what it's focusing on on a given image, it's looking at a single part at, 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 at one time. But on the right-hand side, you have this model that was trained using the rotation prediction task. And instead of focusing on a single part, it's looking at multiple parts at the same time. So if you look at this, image on the bottom right, it's looking at the eye of the cat and sort of it's not at the same time to see if there's like a relationship between those two. And in, in, in the image of a dog, it's looking at both the body of the dog and the face at the same time to see if, if it could like maybe discern some sort of a relationship between the two. So it, it, maybe this is a way to like qualitatively show that these self-supervised learning algorithms are trying to learn something much more beyond supervised training. Turns out that this example is not constrained to just um, CV. You can also do SSL with NLP. Um, one really common example in, L in NLP is something called word to vec which, and the goal of word to vec is to learn embeddings for a single word. Now, the way this can be done is you could predict a word from its surrounding context. So say if you have the sentence, the dog with the man, you could try to predict the word bit from dog and the because a dog should kind of imply that the word bit is associated with it. So this sort of approach is called a continuous bag of words model. There are many other ways to train word to vec models. One example is um, Skipram. So instead of predict predicting a word from a context, you instead predict the context from a word. So you like kind of like flip the model upside down. And there are many other approaches. This is just, these are just like two really common ones. Okay, um, there's also something called wave to vec which is sort of a generalization of word to vec for audio. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of this. I just wanted to show that SSL can also be applied to audio. It's a very broad sort of um, paradigm. And I think the current state of the art in audio classification is wave to vec 2 which I think came out a few years ago. Okay, so what if we go back to this idea of word to vec we are predicting a single word from some surrounding context, right? And we are only considering a few words at a time. What if you predict a word from the entire sentence that, that it is a part of? And as I think, I think you might imagine that this might, this might work better because the sentence will give you more context than just like those two surrounding words. And, and you, you can take this step even further and instead of predicting a single word from a sentence, you can try to predict multiple words from a sentence. And what, when what happens is that you call these like multiple words a masked word, and your goal is to predict the masked word from the rest of the sentence. So if you have a sentence that says a quick dash fox jumps over the dash dog, your goal is to predict the words brown and lazy from this input. And it turns out that this was a really effective approach for learning word embeddings. And there's a very famous model in NLP, in NLP called BERT, which takes this to the next level. It, the BERT is something called a transformer model. You don't need to know what transformers are yet. We will have a lecture on that later in the course. But BERT takes in these sentences that have like mass words and it tries to predict what those mass words are. It actually goes a step further. It actually takes in two sentences instead of one and it predicts the mass words for both of them. And at the same time, it also predicts the order of the sentences. Like you might imagine that if you sample two sentences from a paragraph, one sentence comes before the other one, right? So it tries to do both at the same time. So it learns a word level and a sentence level embedding. Now, 
Bird was a huge success in NLP. And I think Bird is sort of what kickstarted the interest in um, self-supervised learning back in CV because this this idea of SSL and CV kind of like died down a bit in 2015, 2016, 2017, but people started taking more and more interest after people saw that BERT worked really well in, in NLP. And like another reason I included the slide is it turns out that the current state of the art for CV is actually very similar to BERT. So that's the teaser for the lecture where we discuss advanced techniques in um, SSL for CV. So any questions about any of these approaches? Because uh, that's pretty much it for the lecture. So just to give a wrap up, just to give a summary, we went through a whirlwind tour of representation learning, transfer learning, self-supervised learning, and we discussed like different kinds of, we discussed different concepts, terminologies, methodologies, et cetera. I just wanna point out that this specific lecture doesn't have any homework but there is a homework for this entire cluster, which is the PyTorch notebook that should be due next Tuesday. Even though this lecture doesn't have a homework, I mentioned before that there will be a lecture on, on advanced SSL for CV, and that will have a homework. So if you ever need to review uh, the topics from this lecture, so to work on that homework, this slide deck should be up on the website. Again, feel free to do that. Uh, that is it for today. Second pause. Uh, you might just end the meeting. Thank you.